Hi, everyone. Welcome to the Active Towns podcast, conversations about creating a culture of activity. I'm John Simmerman, founder of the Active Towns Initiative and your grateful host during this podcast journey. Thank you so much for tuning in. It's always wonderful to have you along for the ride. In this episode, I'm delighted to welcome Jonathan Fertig, joining us from Denver, Colorado, to talk about some of his active mobility advocacy work. But before we dive into that discussion, please allow me a moment to mention that this episode is being brought to you by the generous contributions of our donors, sponsors, and monthly patrons on our Patreon page. Thank you all so very much for your amazing support. As is frequently the case with most small nonprofits, please know that any donation is greatly appreciated and every little bit adds up. To learn more about how you too can make a huge difference in helping me to produce this content, please head over to our website at activetowns, that's plural, dot O-R-G, and simply click on the donate link at the top right corner of the page. As always, I've included the appropriate links in the show notes. Okay, let's get this conversation with Jonathan Rowland. Jonathan, it's uh, wonderful to have you here on the Active Towns podcast. Welcome. Thank you for having me. So, um, gosh, you know, hey, thank you so much for agreeing to chat with me uh, about your efforts and your activity uh, in the Denver area of active mobility advocacy. Um, But why don't we do this? Why don't we start off with having you just share a little bit uh, about yourself? Sure. Well, so I moved to Denver about two and a half years ago from Boston, um, and I had been in Boston where I grew up um, for the previous 12 years I had left for school, lived in Portland, Oregon, and Atlanta, Georgia for undergrad and graduate school. Um, And then I went to architecture school um, in Boston. And during my time there, I got involved in bicycle advocacy, which then sort of naturally leads you into sort of cities for people and um, advocacy that's about a lot more than just the bicycle. But the bicycle was certainly um, my entree into it. And I, growing up, Loved the bicycle, but it was just a recreational um, and then later a travel tool. I rode across the country when I was um, 16, I think, from Seattle to New Hampshire, but then sort of put it away. And it was just sort of a thing sitting in the um, in the back of the apartment for a number of years. Um, and when I started working in Boston and um, getting frustrated with having to take the subway every day and seeing coworkers who were riding their bikes, I, I was like, hey, I like riding bikes too, I think. Um, and so I started riding and then it just sort of naturally led into advocacy after a number of years. Um, and that's that's sort of the beginning of it. And then um, I, do, I don't know how much of the whole story you want me to go into right away. Um, but the um, I think that as, um, as advocacy in the US sort of had its resurgence in like 2006 or 2007, maybe. Um, at least that's sort of when it was happening in Boston. Um, I started to become aware of the wider issues around infrastructure. You know, first bike lanes and sharrows were going in. Um, and uh, I started to educate myself on it. So um, that was really uh, the, the beginning of uh, a somewhat long career so far, I guess, in advocacy. Fantastic. Yeah. And I want to say that I first became aware of you uh, back when you were in Boston and it was because of your social media presence. You right. were a very uh, active person on Twitter. Yeah. So t- talk a little bit about that side of it. Sure. Uh, because I think it's a, it's significant to um, your story and it, and it speaks a little bit to the leveraging of, you know, the reality of new technology and social media and how cities, you know, evolve and interact these days. Yeah, absolutely. Um, social media wound up being, um, I think fundamental to, to all of my advocacy and in, in particular Twitter. Um, I've, I've never really found Facebook to be particularly useful for advocacy. I know there are a lot of people that do use it like that, um, but I think that the, um, the the character limit of Twitter is is helpful um, in terms of not being um, inundated with thousand word Facebook posts. Um, so 
Twitter was something that I sort of, I think I first discovered it um, during the the Occupy protests in Boston and, and you know, got the first taste of um, how powerful it could be. And then, um, you know, I, I don't even really know what it was about the platform because I wasn't really on it otherwise, wasn't using it much um, in the interim period, um, but started tweeting about more or less exclusively this kind of stuff, um, you know, complete streets and bicycle infrastructure, you know, live tweeting public meetings. Um, and I think that maybe partially because there weren't that many people that were tweeting about it in Boston. Um, it, it, I just wound up developing a significant following. Um, and, and as I became more educated on the subject, I think sort of became known as somebody who who knew what they were talking about and that people would turn to um, if they saw something that drove them crazy or if they had a question about a piece of infrastructure. Um, and then the the social media presence led to, bizarrely, I mean, it certainly wasn't the intention initially, but um, because it's a place where journalists and politicians um, tend to congregate in addition to advocates, um, you, you know, relationships with local press um, and which, allowed for some of the tactical urbanism that I'm sure we'll get into later um, that I was doing on the streets, you know, being very quickly picked up by press um, and then also developing relationships with local politicians because they saw me as somebody who um, was somewhat of an authority within the, within the city of Boston about issues like that. Uh, and so the, the political connection and the press connection it was, really fundamental in terms of me like getting a larger audience but then simultaneously i think one of the really important things about um twitter or social media in general um was just the the constant back and forth because with advocates all over the country all over the world um you know it, in the past say 10 years as this whole movement has really picked up a lot of steam and there's people doing all kinds of interesting stuff all over the all over the place um, you're constantly learning and sharing and sort of stealing ideas, giving ideas, iterating, collaborating um, in a way that just it's hard to imagine how it would happen in a pre-social media landscape. Yeah, yeah, good point. And you mentioned the uh, tactical urbanism or the guerrilla inst installations that became right. a big part of that movement. And if memory serves, I mean, you were you were kind of doing some of these activities even prior to necessarily tactical urbanism being, you know, coined as a term. You know, uh, Mike mm. Lydon is a good friend of mine and yeah. was a, a previous guest on, on on the Active Towns podcast. Yeah. It, 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 do I have that timing about right? Um, I, I'd love to say yes, but no. Um, okay. I'm, <laughs> um, I, I'm very much influenced by Mike's book and. Um, you know, I think reading um, reading his book, Tactical Urbanism, on a summer vacation, uh, I don't know, um, 2016 or so, somewhere around there, 2015, 2014, um, whenever that was that that book came out, um, I came home from summer vacation sort of ready to get down to business and sort of, you know, I was really inspired that, and I was starting to see a lot more of it on social media as well. Um, so. Um, you know, I had seen, I, I'm an architect by training as well. So I, you know, sort of been exposed to, to tactical urbanism as a, um, you know, sort of design intervention, um, I guess, um, and through some lectures and stuff like that. But it, there wasn't really much of a, I never saw a way to utilize tactical urbanism in my professional capacity, but as an advocate, I, I began to see how powerful it could be. Um, and so, um, yeah, uh, Mike's Mike's book is, I think, fundamental to everything that came afterwards for me. Right, and uh, let's let's bring a visual in here for uh, sure. the audience. Let's talk a little bit about some of the installations that you did, because uh, again, that that's part of what made you quote unquote famous. Right. You know, in the Twitter yeah. Twitter sphere is is the fact that you know people would be lo looking at these things and right. installation be like. Oh yeah, that's so cool! And then they would right. take off like wildfire around the country and around the world. Yeah, absolutely. You know that that aspect of social media as well. Um, 
you know, was something that I, I became very aware of in that tactical urbanism ties into it so well that if you can create something that that involves um, a really great image or, or it doesn't have to be um, something as sort of graphic as a lot of the stuff that I did graphic in a sort of um, technical sense not not um, explicit um, but um, the imagery can just like you said it explodes online and you can tell there's some things that I've done where I'm laying it out I go oh, this is sort of perfect for um, you know taking off virally and it gets the it gets the message out far and wide um, the you know one of the things that Mike really emphasizes I think in the book is is creating something that is interesting and beautiful um, as well as informative and uh, functional. And that that was always key for me is, was introducing something sort of whimsy, some sort of whimsy into into the interventions that I did. So let's let's actually uh, pull out a couple of them mm -hmm. as an example. Sure. If memory serves, there was uh, some cones with maybe some flowers in them. Yes, absolutely. So cones and flowers were the first thing that I did, um, and I. Uh, it was not long after um, a young woman who was a doctor in Boston was killed um, in an intersection that I used to ride to work every day. So it, it really hit me hard. And um, one Saturday afternoon, I, I was just very shortly after she had been killed, I was feeling particularly frustrated and I'd been sort of trying to figure out something to do. Um, and so I went and I took um, like six cones from a construction site that was nearby. And I... Um, bought a bunch of mums. It was the fall, so mums were in season at Home Depot. So they were like eight dollars a, a bunch. Um, they were pre-potted, and um, I dropped those in the street in a to create a protected bike lane, just for it was maybe a hundred feet or so, two hundred feet, um, and put cones and uh, sort of cone flower, cone flower, um, on this one block, and and it that was the first thing that I did that went viral um, and that I was able to do crowdfunding off of, which is also something that ties in well with the social media that I do something with a really good image and then do some crowdfunding on it so I could fund better materials. So the first one, you know, I had to grab cones from a construction site. Like later on, I was able to buy my own stash of a hundred cones because I had raised the money and, you know, buy nicer flowers and, um, and more flowers. Uh, so that first intervention with the cones of flowers, I think I wound up raising six or seven thousand dollars off the back of it, which was incredible. And in itself, the fact that I raised that much money went viral. You know, people were like, "Well, how the hell?" You know, I mean, it, it was crazy. It happened in like a weekend. Yeah, you know, yeah, whatever. exactly. Yeah. So, what was the response from the municipality at the time from the city? Um, typically this the city of boston um would wind up sort of being put on its heels because i was most of my interventions wound up being um in response to fatalities so they were already um kind of um in tight spot and not really you know they didn't really have much to defend um and so the the, the city would typically especially early on um take a, a sort of gentle approach of us you know we hear that there's community concern and we're looking at doing stuff and you know, that it, intersection in particular, I mean, the city was already sort of in the process of um, taking out a turn lane and they were going to put in a protected bike lane for the, for that one block. Um, and so they, you know, maybe it put a little bit more fire under their butts to do it quickly. Um, but, in, you know, in general, that was also something that was important to me was that I was going to take, credit for it publicly because i felt like you know a lot of people feel powerless and that was really where where i had been coming from was feeling powerless about how to change stuff and they didn't you know i, I wanted there to be a face to this that there was there were real people who were concerned um and that um i was not going to shy away from uh from taking credit or blame, however it may be, for the for the intervention that I did. Um, which, you know, is, is something that a lot of people wouldn't necessarily be able to do. Um, it's, 
something that I've talked about often over the past couple of years is that a lot of the things that I've done are things that people who are in um, communities that are often over-policed, like black and brown communities, um, may not feel comfortable publicly taking credit for something and, and shoving it in the city's face. Um, so I sort of tried to utilize the privilege that I have as a white guy, bike advocate, um, and to push the envelope in terms of um, how aggressive I would get about putting stuff in the street. Right, right. And one of the other themes that uh, uh, early on there in, in the Boston area that you also uh, had was, you know, this desire to try to rehumanize the streets. And uh, one of your installations that you did was literally like a cutout of, right. of people. Talk a little bit about that particular uh, project and yeah. because it, 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 it took on, I mean, in the advocacy world, we talk about this all the time. It's like, you know, we're, we're not cyclists. We're people who happen to be on a bike and trying to rehumanize that and get away from the victim blaming and all of that. But yours actually took on a whole life of its own. Talk a little right. bit about that. Yeah. So that this was an intervention that I had in the works for God, but I mean, by the time it went into the street, I probably had been working on it for six months. I had done a crowdfunding off of another intervention that I had done, um, not the first one. So I had, I don't know, I think maybe 11 or 1200 bucks. And I had been tossing around this idea with Becca Wright, who goes by Bikey Face. She had been doing um, bicycle themed uh, comics. And she put out a couple books. And she lives in Boston or Cambridge at the time. And we started, I had hit her up one time um, and we were sort of tossing ideas back and forth. And she hadn't really been involved in anything tactical urbanism. And I had had this idea of wanting to put art into the street more than just flowers had started to become um, like my calling guard. I was, I would always include flowers um, to, the great extent possible, at least, um, in my interventions. But I really wanted to do something um, more art-based. And so she sketched up something quick one day and, and sent it to me in a Twitter DM. And, and we established the idea that she would draw a couple characters and I would print them out really large because I worked in an architecture firm. We, I have access to um, you know large format plotters that can print out three or four feet wide by however long I needed them to be. So she in the end drew up, um, I think it was four, maybe five different characters that um, some were, I think I think one maybe was a character that she had done before. And then other ones were like of the mayor. There was one with the mayor and um, Matt Damon because with a local Boston connection. Um, and we printed them out. They wound up being about six feet tall. I printed them on glossy photo paper and mounted them to gator board, which is like half inch thick foam core with a thick sort of rigid uh, cardboard face on each side. And then I bought 1200 pounds of concrete and a whole bunch of the five gallon Home Depot buckets and some six or seven foot tall metal fence posts. And the idea was that I was gonna embed the fence posts in the concrete buckets and mount the art to it and then put these in the street in areas where um, they need particular attention. And it was all along Mass Ave, which is a main thoroughfare through Boston, which also was my um, my commute. I have a, a sort of philosophy of adopting your commute because it's just a lot easier um, to, and you know it so well, to deal with stuff on the street that you, that you typically ride. So we, um, we did 20 of them and I had the concrete and the buckets and the fence posts sitting in the garage at my office for months and months, sort of trying to, I was waiting for the right time. And then it was also just a huge undertaking to do uh, the cutting. I cut out all the figures um, that she had drawn and it was, it, it just took me an incredible amount of time to get everything in a place where I was ready to actually do the install. And then the mayor responded to, I think it was a fatality. Um, if not, it was just a spate of injuries um, with a sort a really like a uh, tactless comment. And the advocacy community was uh, all up in arms. And I was sort of 
this is it. This is the moment that I have to seize. And I think that that's a really important aspect of a lot of the work is, is see, seeing when there's a moment that your advocacy can be that much more effective. And this was one of those times. So um, even though I had worked alone for pretty much, I think everything that I'd done up until that time, this stuff was so unwieldy and heavy. Uh, like I said, it was 1,200 pounds worth of concrete in the buckets. Um, so I wound up having to rent a U-Haul van, and I had three friends that came over. And then in the middle of the night, we we went out and um, and did it. And I had even tipped off a local journalist at the Boston Globe who I who had covered some of my stuff before and said, "Hey, like I've got something going on, and it's going to be really cool." And I sent them a couple pictures. And so I think it wound up getting on the front page of the Globe the next day. Um, although it was, it was below the fold. <laughs> um, and it, um, it, and it completely blew up. The images were, you know, they were very graphic. It was black and white, um, of these characters standing on Mass Ave with, they had big thought bubbles coming out of them, sort of asking drivers to watch their doors when they're opening them into the bike lane, or how about we have a protective bike lane here or stuff to that effect. Um, and, um, the the imagery was just great um it sort of rained that night into the mornings the streets were wet um and there was you know people were then riding into work and seeing these six seven foot tall um cartoon characters in the middle of the street and so then they start taking pictures of them and posting them online and the whole thing um just kind of blew up and there, there wound up being a lot of great press about it and you know i think that it's it helped to reinforce that this was a, a corridor that really needed some serious attention from, from the city has the highest bike traffic in the city. And it, it could be so much more than it was. And the city has actually done a considerable amount to it since I've left. Yeah. How long did those survive? <laughs> Less than 24 hours. Less than 24 hours. Yeah. But the concept and the idea survived because yeah, and that was, that was it spread. Key. Yeah. You know, it didn't, it, it achieved what it needed to. I mean, obviously I would have liked for it to stay up for months and months, um, but it achieved what it needed to. Um, you know, once once it's viral online, then it's it's not going away. Um, and it arriving on the front page of the paper that the mayor receives on his desk every morning achieves um, a lot more than it would if it's just, if he had, didn't know about it, but it's staying up for um, for six months. So it was bittersweet that it got taken down. Um, yeah. But the, I, you know, the return like, yeah, on investment I, was pretty, pretty astounding. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. And correct me if I'm wrong. Uh, didn't another city sort of pick up on the idea and run with that uh, as, as, as part of their efforts? I'm trying to remember if somebody else did comic art. I'm not sure. Maybe. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I, I I was like trying to think back because this was yeah. what several years ago, right? It was several years ago. Now this yeah. was um, maybe four years ago. I think. Okay, three or four years ago. Okay, yeah. so let's sort of put a, a bow on the the Boston area in your in your tenure there. You you alluded to it just a moment ago in terms of that the city is is progressing and and you know yeah. and moving things along. So let's let's talk a little bit about you know that uh, you know before we transition over into into Denver. Sure. Um, well, you know one of the <clears throat> the aspects that I had mentioned earlier was the political connections, and so in particular, one of the connections that I had made in Boston was with Michelle Wu, who at the time was president of the city council and um, really began to develop an interest in transportation as a key issue in her campaigning and in her just day-to-day -day political work. Um, you know, I think she had sort of nibbled around the edges of it, but by the time I left Boston, she was probably the strongest transportation advocate politically in the city, certainly in, in one of the most in the state, really. Um, and she was president of the city council. So she had an, a really, really big stage in which to advocate for stuff. And, um, you know, I wound up serving as a sort of informal and sometimes formal transportation advisor, um, in particular for bike ped stuff. Um, 
less so transit, but sometimes you know we talk about transit stuff because they they wind up intersecting. And um, you know, she arranged for meetings with me and the head of the transportation department and the mayor's chief of staff uh, in order to sort of air my grievances and to um, you know give me a platform to say you know this is what I see is wrong and this is you know the direction I think that you guys need to be moving in. Um, you know, I wouldn't be so bold to say that the the conversations that I had with them are the re reason why stuff is changing. I think it was already somewhat moving in that direction, but she um, consistently was was applying a lot of pressure. Um, and I think that that has um, played a big role in, in the city treating transportation um, with the importance that it deserves and, and treating the walk, bike, um, transit, issues with the importance that, that they deserve over cars. You know, I mean, I think that um, like any American city, Boston wound up sort of um, just giving up um, and, and letting cars uh, run wild over the city, um, you know, from the 50s onwards until really, you know, the past decade. And so there's a lot of making up to do. Um, and it's a city that's uniquely positioned, I think, you know, along with some of the other old cities on the East Coast to really be, um, you know, to achieve European levels of walk, bike, transit, um, mode share. Yeah. And given the fact that the distances traveled yeah. by so many people um, in that whole region in the in in that whole metroplex area right. and you know the combination and the po potential with transit there too oh, yeah. uh and just keeping up with the joneses across the river you know you've got cambridge that's making yeah. some bold steps and 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 moving towards yeah. uh more and more separated and protected facilities so um yeah. you know it's it's wonderful to see that the city of boston is stepping up and is you know i, I just saw a few more uh, press releases this past week or so of uh, additional progress being made. So, hey, good on you for helping to influence and be part of that movement. Um, and 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 I think you're right. I mean, it's it's about timing and being in the yeah. right place at the right time and seizing that opportunity. So, talking about seizing an opportunity, you're right? You guys moved <laughs> we moved yeah you know you all of a sudden you're 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 this this twitter phenom <laughs> and you know things are moving and shaking in boston but then yeah. you uh decided that you know the air was just too thick there you right. needed some thinner air and less oxygen so you decided yeah. to go to mile high city mile high city what yeah. happened um so you know uh, my wife and i had met when we were undergrads in portland oregon and she's from the west coast and we had talked about moving west for a long time. So, you know, we, for years, um, we had been doing our, our sort of spring vacation. We would go to different cities in the country and um, travel around and, and see, like, is this a place that we could live? Um, and, you know, my, my rule was typically that we weren't going to rent a car. So that I wanted to know what it would be like to, well, we have a car. I didn't want it to be something that I'd have to use to live in the city and to get around the city. So, you know, we went to LA for like a week and a half and didn't rent a car, which people thought we were insane. Um, and, you know, walked all over the place and then decided, well, no, I don't think LA is the place. And we did the same thing in Boise, Idaho and almost worked, almost moved to Boise. Um, but we came to Denver and really liked it. And, and I wound up getting a great job here. So um, we packed up our stuff in Boston and um, an enormous moving van and drove that big rig out to the Mile High City. And we've settled in downtown Denver since ever since we moved out, which has been um, really interesting change. You know, in the downtown, um, the denser neighborhoods in Boston were places that I could never afford, but I always would have liked to live in. Um, and all of a sudden we moved to Denver and it's sort of like, well, you know, um, there isn't really a neighborhood here from an East Coast perspective, at least that was prohibitively expensive. So we're in lower downtown, which is right near Denver Union Station and in the thick of sort of everything, which has been a really interesting uh, move for us. Yeah, yeah. And and what a wonderful place to, to choose uh, yeah. in, in terms of, you know, of that Denver area. Um, back in the mid-90s, I was 
working in in downtown Denver, commuting via bus from from Boulder, and lower downtown was just starting to come along. And so, I mean, I would say half of the 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 old buildings and 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 these were like old, you know, turn of the century brick structures were yeah. were still abandoned many of them mm -hmm. were crack houses and right. <laughs> it was still a little bit of a rough neighborhood but now we're talking about a, a major um gosh it, it, it's like an activity central down there you've got the river yeah. going through and there's people out you know biking and walking and running and kayaking and it's just it, it's it's nonstop uh activity so i love i like to say that you know that lower downtown denver area is you know, a, a slice of what I was used to in Boulder as mm -hmm. you know, like a quintessential active town sort of environment. So super right. cool. Now behind you in the video here yeah. that we can see in is a, uh, is a plethora of bikes. And one of them in, in particular, and since you, you mentioned your wife, I mean, is a tandem. So yeah. talk a little bit about that special aspect of it. And, and we'll stick with the theme of mm -hmm. the fact that you guys are making the most of being in the Mile High City and being yeah. in the Rocky Mountains. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So right behind me, um, let's see, <laughs> is our, uh, our fat tandem with five inch tires. So after we moved to lower downtown, uh, we had moved out here with two individual fat bikes. And uh, unfortunately, one of the um, Part of the deal of moving to downtown Denver is it's also the capital of bike theft. Um, and so our, our fat bikes were stolen uh, on like New Year's Eve uh, a couple of years ago. And out of our garage, they were locked up on the wall, the bolt cutters, the whole thing. So with the insurance money, um, I decided with some long conversations with my wife, and she was actually sort of the one who was pushing it because we have a road tandem, which is down in, in the garage here, which we've been riding for a while. Um, and I was saying, you know, what, it would be fun to get a, a mountain bike tandem, a fat tandem instead of two individual bikes. And I was like, I don't know. And she really pushed me to do it. So, um, I got this Ventana El Gran Jefe is the model and I bought the frame and I built it all up and with some bike packing bags. And yeah, like you alluded to, since we moved out here, um, you know, having access to the Rocky Mountains, to the Utah desert, to um, to Idaho, Wyoming. I mean, it's, I never would have dreamed that that the outdoors would play as crucial a role. I mean, it was it was an important reason for us moving out here, um, but now it's become sort of fundamental for us on the weekends and our vacations are, are all getting out hiking or biking, or there's also two whitewater kayaks back there. Um, and, yeah, so we've we've taken um, that tandem all over um, Utah, the San Rafael Swell, to Canyonlands, to um, you know high mountains in Colorado, to uh, Western Wyoming. It's it's been um, just a it's a super fun bike, and we can load it up with all kinds of stuff and ride it pretty much anywhere. Fantastic. Yeah, yeah, it's it's been such a joy following you um, in social media and seeing you be able to experience, you know, that joy of yeah. of being, you know, having all of these wonderful assets, you know, close by and being able to take advantage on the weekends and on your vacations and get out Fantastic. there, explore. Yeah. yeah, that's great. Good stuff. So reason I reached out to you for uh, this particular interview, though, was the fact that you've sort of plugged and played in terms of right. your <laughs> engagement in yeah. advocacy for, for safe, active mobility. And I think it was a, a Nine News interview where you were being interviewed about the Denver Complete Streets design report that had come out. I think it was right. probably in July or August when, I, uh, when that came out. So l let's talk a little bit about yeah. Denver and uh and and what you've been up to yeah so you know that is one of the um really nice things about um being connected to the greater advocacy world on social media was that when i moved here it was like i already had a community like this day i showed up you know i had already started um connecting with people and some people i had already you know sort of known online and within yeah, you know, the first week of, of being here, I was already 
I think I, I did an interview with Streets Blog within a month. I, I was meeting um, people from Bicycle Colorado, from Bike Denver, which was still in existence at the time. Walk Denver. Um, it it was it's just so nice to to go to a new city and already have people working on the same stuff, and you know then when you're new to a city and you have fresh eyes and you wind up um, seeing things, it's that people who have been there for a long time, you know, they saw it at one point, but now it just doesn't bother them anymore. It doesn't bother them to the extent that it does a newcomer. So I sort of had a whole, a whole new um, round of uh, frustration that I could <laughs> um, express for them, I guess, you know, that, that there's a lot of, a lot of car centric design in Denver that still needs to get fixed. Um, and but there's a, a really big group of people here that are working on it um and so yeah i got plugged in with with folks pretty rapidly and then um i guess after i had been here for probably a little under a year i guess um i initiated a, a critical mass ride which denver hadn't had in a number of years um, denver has an unbelievable amount of uh, bicycle and pedestrian fatalities stuff that would have um, I mean, it's like, I think, I think it might be an order of magnitude worse than it is in Boston. I mean, it's really terrible. And so that was hard to get used to, you know, in Boston, um, fatalities were fortunately a relatively rare occurrence. Um, and here it would seem like they were happening weekly and I just, I could not believe what was going on. So I helped to organize a critical mass ride, which we wound up getting, I don't know, a couple hundred people, um, and, and getting a bunch of press. Uh, around it, but then an outgrowth of it was that I helped to start um, the Denver Bicycle Lobby, um, primarily with Rob Toffness, who is um, an advocate here, and in addition, um, John Rickey, who's uh, another advocate, and Rob's a programmer, so he wound up putting all kinds of sort of techn technological uh, infrastructure up really quickly. Um, he has a website and the Slack channel, which has become incredibly active with I don't even know how many people we have in it at this point. It's hard for me to keep up. Um, and that's, you know, helped to really organize a lot of the advocates in a way that, you know, sometimes I, I think, especially with the loss of Bike Denver, um, you know, Bicycle Colorado doesn't necessarily have the bandwidth to do a lot of um, the stuff that um, the, the people who are sort of doing in the Slack channels. Um, and so it's helped to pick up some of the slack for them. I mean, Bicycle Colorado is an incredible organization, but there's only so much they can do. So, um, and you know, it's also, um, and the Denver Bicycle Lobby can do stuff maybe that, that you know, Bicycle Colorado doesn't feel comfortable doing. They, we can be a little more outspoken or, um, you know, engage in tactical urbanism, which Rob and I did as part of this Red Cup project um, that happened, I guess that was probably a year and a half ago or so now too. So yeah, yeah. There's been, there's been a lot going on uh, in Denver. I mean, I I will say that I I feel like I've been somewhat less um, active here, and I think that part of that has been that feeling as though there's so many other people right. now, especially with this Denver bicycle lobby, um, that are doing it. I there were times in Boston where I felt like, and this is not to say that I was the only one doing. It. Obviously, there were hundreds of people working on stuff, but especially initially, I felt like. Like I was the only one who like had the time to do all this other stuff. And, you know, I felt like I was sort of a man on a mission. And now I feel like there's so many other people there that it's, I don't have to do a zillion things at once. There's other people who can pick up some of that weight, which has been phenomenal. So it doesn't completely take over my life because advocacy has a chance, has a, sure. a tendency to do that. Yeah, 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 you're yeah. right. And yeah, it's it's that challenge though, right? In the advocacy world, you, you do have your your formal advocacy organizations and oftentimes they're working very, very closely with the municipalities, with the cities. Right. And so it's always good to also have the activist groups and you know, Absolutely. whether they are, you know completely organized like the bicycle lobby or whether it's you know a you know a more ad hoc type of thing like a, a yeah. critical mass ride that you know yep. you know pops up every once in a while and i and i love critical mass the ones with the kids yeah those are great yeah <laughs> those i think are there fantastic. are a couple of those that have been going on out here i think arlie has um out in aurora right. has organized some of those as well yeah yeah good stuff so and then along comes the pandemic 
right? <laughs> and uh, Denver, you know, was definitely one of those cities that um, was at the forefront of many of the slow streets movements and yep. and and the the identification of some space and carving out some space. Uh, talk a little bit about, you know, from your perspective and, and from yeah. your view, uh, how the city is, is responding to that. Um, not just, not just the city, you know, meaning the, the municipality, but also the community. Sure. Yeah. I mean, or, you know, originally, like you said, the city was relatively quick to, uh, institute a number of corridors and to close down the streets and parking lots that are running through, um, a bunch of the city's parks. And um, it was a huge, huge relief for us personally, experiencing the pandemic in the city, uh, you know, living downtown and needing, you know, at the time the, the order was they didn't want you to go more than 10 miles from the house. So, you know, going up to the mountains on the weekend was no longer an option. And, you know, I mean, my wife and I were fortunate enough that we were from home and, and remained employed and have remained employed throughout this, um, the whole pandemic, but still we, you know, it, especially early on, it's just, you know, it felt treacherous leaving the house. And so having these outlets where we could walk was just, um, uh, incredible. And so every weekend, essentially we would go walk from the house, um, or ride to one and then, you know, walk these open streets, um, that, that the city had set up and, you know, in, Initially, it was, you know, um, from a d design perspective, I don't think I was I was super choosy about what they had done. Um, you know, I, I think I had some criticisms, but in general, it was like the fact that they did anything was great. You know, I, I think the the thing that um, has held them back a bit is that the city has it seems tied to using, you know. Um, barriers that are MUTCD compliant and they're renting them and it costs them like, I don't know, $70,000 a month or something uh, on that order to rent these, you know, sandbags and big signs and whatever that are at the intersections and then they get damaged um, or they get moved. And so, you know, I think that one of the key tenets of tactical urbanism, which the city is essentially employing here is iterating and seeing what's working and what's not and trying to change stuff so that you can improve its effectiveness. And, the, you know, the, the city, you know, understandably has, has not had a lot of bandwidth to deal with this kind of stuff, but, um, you know, there, there's too much traffic on some of the streets because they're not completely closed in general, other than in the parks, the, the streets themselves um, just have some big signs in the middle of the intersections that, tell people driving that it's for local traffic only and, and people walking are allowed to just walk into the middle of the street. Um, but there's, we've had a number of uh, experiences where people are driving way too fast, you know, near people. And so I think that there's, um, there were some opportunities for the city to do pretty quick, cheap um, interventions to change the way that those things are designed um, that haven't happened. And I think that there's also, from what I understand, uh, the risk that they're going to go away this winter um, because the city doesn't really feel like paying to rent all these barriers anymore and maintaining it through the winter is potentially going to be a problem. So, you know, I think that that it, it'll be interesting to see where it goes. The, the park closures were um, were really interesting because, you know, first of all, it's sort of like why on earth are there roads blasting through the middle of the parks anyways? We sh they <laughs> These should be closed. And you would think that normally that'd be the kind of thing that a parks department would be advocating for. Um, but they seemed a little bit ambivalent, but I think that they've seen how, how much better it is. And I don't think that there's really anybody who's in the park who would say, Oh, I wish that that road was open. I'm sure that there are drivers that, that do. Um, and I know that the parking uh, that they had closed has been, uh, there've been some issues about providing accessible parking, uh, which was removed. Um, that'll probably get worked out. But I think that the long-term um, reevaluation of how the how vehicular access is provided or not in our city parks um, will be a really important um, long-standing outcome from this. Uh, the you know the the city sidewalk closure um, for for dining, allowing restaurants to either take part of the sidewalk or 
a parking lane if they route the sidewalk around, um, you know, has been um, a mixed bag. But in, in general, there's been a lot of good stuff that's come out. And I think that there's been, uh, again, I think the, the long-term impacts of that will, will be positive. Y you know, the, the city is sort of, um, it, as in cities all over the country or really all over the world, I mean, they're just, um, I'm sure, responding to a million things at once. And so, you know, a lot of these problems that pop up, I think, are, are really just attributable to the pressure that they're under to get this stuff done really quickly. So I uh, try to cut them some slack, even though some of the stuff I see drives me nuts. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and, and just look how far we've come in just the last, yeah. you know, five, you know, plus years of, you know, when you actually have cities, municipalities um, able to respond as quickly as they have to a devastating pandemic and, and <laughs> do their own version of a little tactical urbanism and, yeah. you know, test something out and reiterate and, and, and just give it a try. Right. What's interesting is that you had mentioned, you know, a, a little bit about the fact that on a per capita basis, the the num number of fatalities in the Denver area are, are quite concerning. Yeah. And I attribute it most definitely uh, having just recently spent some time in the Cambridge and Boston area is that, it, you know, the level of congestion that you have there is that, you know, motor vehicles really don't have much opportunity to get up to speeds, you know, quite as easily as on some of the, the Western wide open oh, strodes where, you know, it's typical in, in, in a, in the city environment like Denver, like in Austin, mm -hmm. uh, like Los Angeles, the, you know, motor vehicles are, are routinely getting up to, uh, near lethal and beyond lethal uh, oh, yeah. speeds. So let's yeah. talk a little bit about speed because that's yeah. something that Denver is, is grappling with because right. of the pandemic and because of the traffic calming that has been happening out on these streets. I'm catching yeah. a lot of, of, uh, momentum. I'm seeing a lot mm -hmm. of progress that seems to be, made at least from a community perspective with a lot more families and a lot more community members uh asking for for slower speeds yeah can you address that a little bit yeah i mean you know um i heard your conversation with joe locantori from the denver streets partnership and you know i think that one of the things that she hit on that that i completely agree with is that um you know, while while we may reduce the speed limit, say like Boulder did to Boulder did to twenty or twenty five, I'm not sure. Um, and I, I think that you know the the similar push here, um, while good, will not do a whole lot if we aren't doing anything to the geometry of the streets or you know um, changing the way the traffic flows here. I it, like you said, like I mean, I find it um, much more intimidating to ride a bike on the streets here than I did in Boston and Cambridge. And that's because like I joke with people, there's no traffic here. I mean, sure. The highways used to be congested a little bit, um, you know, during rush hour, but I mean, downtown or, you know, all of the sort of core of the city, there is virtually no traffic except for on a couple of arterials. And so people just drive way too fast and the roads are straight wide. Um, and the lights are timed to, you know, in general, allow the people to drive too fast. And um, it's terrifying to ride on a lot of the streets here. In Boston I would, and Cambridge, I would ride on essentially every street that there was and feel fine whether there was a bike lane or not. Here, there are pl plenty of streets that have bike lanes that they don't like riding on. Um, you know, I've, I've never ridden on the sidewalk as much as I do living here. Um, and you know, I hate doing that, but that's, that's the case. So, you know, I mean, it's great. And I, I completely support the city lowering speed limits, but there's, there's a lot of really fundamental work that the city has to do. And, um, you know, it's, it's a big philosophy change. There's people who really only know the West and know these big wide roads. Uh, you know, I mean, the fact that there are six, six lane one way streets in downtown here is, is crazy. It's absolutely crazy. And so um, the city has to change that stuff. You can't put a 20 mile an hour speed limit on a six lane one way and expect people to go 20 miles an hour. It's just not going to work. 
Yeah, yeah, you've got to get the design right. It's it, it can't you can't just hang your hat on changing the speed limit and and say okay let's let's have enforcement take care of everything. Right, uh, that's a recipe for disaster. We know that it, yep. you really do need to change the geometry of the street, which is one of the reasons why I've been so encouraged by what we're, we've been seeing worldwide with the transformation of the street space is that it gives. Uh, community members an opportunity to re-envision what their streets yeah. are for yeah. and uh, let's let's hold on to that hope that um, that that reimagining and that yeah. that paradigm shift is will will we'll stay there and, and you will catch hold oh absolutely uh, yeah so Jonathan is there anything that we haven't yet talked about that you want to make sure we cover today um Oh God, I don't know. Um, is there anything? No, not really. I mean, I, I'm I'm up for whatever you're interested in. I don't know. It's been a, a sort of long and varied advocacy career. So fantastic. Um, well, I tell you so what, we'll do is I'll, I'll tee up this next question for you, and if anything else comes to mind, then then we can go from there. And okay. this question is is of course the question that I propose to everybody. So so for those listeners out there who uh, might be inspired by our conversation here today, what advice would you have for them? Go and do it and don't wait for somebody else. That was the biggest thing, the biggest sort of light bulb moment for me was the second where I was like, you know, I'd been ex waiting for, why isn't the Boston Cyclist Union gonna do this for me? Or why, or, you know, instigate this or a mass bike or Bicycle Colorado, Bike Denver, you know, the day where I was like, I'm just gonna do this on my own. I'm gonna go, you know, and it's not gonna be huge. I'm gonna put four cones in the street. Um, or, you know, I'm gonna go to that meeting, to a public meeting, I've never been to one. It's so much easier now that they're all virtual. I'm gonna live tweet it or, um, you know, not waiting for permission from the official advocacy organizations to, if you have an idea to just go out and do it is the easiest thing. And I think the most effective way to sort of get the ball rolling. That's fantastic. And not at all surprised that that was the direction you were going to take this. <laughs> That's great. Well, Jonathan, thank you so very much for joining me on the Active Towns oh, podcast. I'm glad we got to do this. This was great. Thank you all so very much for tuning into this episode. I certainly hope you are inspired by Jonathan's story of community engagement. Please be sure to check out the show notes for some articles and video clips highlighting his efforts. A couple of quick reminders before we part ways. Please don't hesitate to drop me a line if you have any suggested topics or guests, questions, or if you happen to have any leads on potential podcast sponsors. My email address is john, that's Joe H-N, at activetowns.org. It's always wonderful to hear from y'all. And as a final reminder, please consider making a financial contribution to Active Towns so I can keep bringing you this content. To learn more, just go to activetowns.org and click on that blue donate link in the top right corner of the page. Thank you. Well, that's all for episode number 52. So until next time, this is John signing off by wishing you much activity, health, and happiness. Cheers. <laughs>